This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got a Monday night football doubleheader to close out week number two. We've got the Saints, the Panthers, the Browns at the Steelers. We're here today to break down both those games, talk about traditional markets, player props, and so much more to get you ready for what should be a fun night on the gridiron. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here as always every Monday by Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W Ryan. Two games coming up for tonight. How has your week two been thus far? Yeah, week two's been uh, been good, Jim. We talked about taking advantage of uh, what people you know think is going to be the whole season uh, in one week of, of week one. So, you know, we were able to... We were able to bounce back a little bit. You know, it still does pain me to see uh, the Bears not able to close up uh, a, a victory on the road there against Tampa. But, you know, I think uh, it was heavy, heavily on Josh Allen uh, this week, uh, which came to fruition, which I know you and uh, Mr. Brandon Gadula were on as well. Uh, if you listen to the Heat Check pod and uh, was able to uh, uh, make amends there in the afternoon slate, as well as the night slate, you know, with Miami being able to uh, to cover against the New England Patriots. So it's it's been a great week, too. We're hoping to carry that on into tonight's slate. We got two games to bet on, which is usually the week one Monday night yeah. slate where they give us two games. And now they're doing it with week two, Jim. So, uh, and week three. I'm trying to prepare for it. There are two games next week, too. So this is actually a double dip. And, like, both you and I play DFS. So, like – having the two game slates on Monday is kind of a blissful way to end it. Like from a data perspective, it's really annoying to have four teams where I don't have their full week two data yet. But from a DFS perspective, I will certainly take that. Now we're going to dive in, talk about Saints Panthers first, then dive into the Browns and the Steelers later on. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. Ryan is back with us tomorrow to break down some power rankings, changes, futures markets. And I'll take a look at my thoughts on week three. Uh, from a spread and total perspective, that is up tomorrow right here in the same feed. Of course, Ed Fang with us on Wednesday, Thursday. JJ Zacharyson on uh, Friday, along with Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja, all right here in the Covering the Spread podcast feed. As always, you can find these not just on that podcast feed, but also on FanDuel's YouTube page on, and on FanDuel TV+. Plus. Go to FanDuel.com slash watch or check out FanDuel TV Plus on Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku devices. We've also got Daily Fantasy for tonight. Night, not just uh, betting. There's a two game slate along with both single game slates. The Monday night special contest on FanDuel $9 entry, $600,000 in total prizes, including 100K to first place. Then check out single game offerings for both Saints at Panthers and Browns at Steelers. To find a contest that fits your style, go to fanduel.com or download the FanDuel app. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's begin things here by talking about the Saints at the Panthers. We're right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. The Saints are three-point favorites. Total in this game is 39 and a half. Ryan, let's talk about those traditional markets first for the Saints and the Panthers. I'm not seeing much value here personally on either side. Any read for you on a side or a total here? Yeah, this one is a is a tough one, Jim. I feel like uh, and the number feels right. Um, which is always usually a, a stay away from me. But if we are talking about a side just for just for the people at home, you know, we have been seeing um, under or I'm sorry, we saw the overs um, hit in immense fashion in week two with these teams kind of getting right. I believe there are only two unders yesterday on Sunday. That would have been the Sunday night game and the Chiefs and Jaguars game, uh, which was very shocking uh, to only hit. What was it? 26 points or whatever yeah. it was. Um, and so, you know, when the under is over, or when the over-under is coming in under 40, you know, I'm always a little bit interested on that. I know this is a primetime game, but, you know, both of these defenses, they're kind of missing some pieces uh, on both sides. J.C. Horn, is specifically for the Carolina Panthers, um, is tough, as I know we'll get into the receiver plays. I also do like the New Orleans Saints here, just, you know, getting the three points on the road. Um you know, it, it like I said, it feels right, but I think the Saints just kind of match up a little bit better uh, than this Panthers team. They have to show me a little bit more before I'm willing to uh, to to take them in, in such fashion. Uh, you know, the juice is a little bit 
uh, too much for me on the money line, I feel like, for for the Saints just straight up. But, you know, when we're getting to minus three, you know, at minus 110 there with just a little bit of juice, I, I'm willing to go that route there and, and maybe dabble on the over. Yeah, I think the over, if I were forced to pick something, would be where I'd go to. My numbers have the the total here, 41.1. Uh, total is 39 and a half. So not a, I don't trust my total model enough to feel confident in that. Uh, we're still working on that one, but it does show value in the over here, uh, 39 and a half. So interested there. Uh, the money line, I, I think, is a value for the Saints, but not a big enough value to justify taking. Either went odds at 62.3%, their implied odds 61.8%, so less than a percentage point of value there. So I agree with you, where more so leans, and I think the over, if you were to force me to bet something, would go there. But personally, I stay away from you across the board in that regard. But I do agree with your thought process, Ryan, talking about the Saints passing offense. And I thought they looked great last week. I know that like they put up 17 points against the Titans, but the Titans defense is pretty good. And having Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid, Michael Thomas all paired together with a competent quarterback, I think it'd be kind of fun. So what's your read on the player props on the Saints side of things here? Yeah, I think, you know, Rashid Shahid is the the interesting one for me, Jim. If we're going to talk about this guy and, and just getting involved with him, you know, you look at his over yards at 40 and a half, uh, anytime touchdown, you know, I think we're almost getting two to one on, on that as well. And he just kind of, you know, picking up from where he left off. Uh, a three to one now on a Vandal split break as I see the plus three ten. That that's amazing. Um, picking up kind of where he left off, you know, last year, and that that was a different regime. Uh, you know, we still have Dennis Allen in in the mix there and the offensive coordinator and and such. But with Derek Carr being there, you know, this guy with the Raiders, he's been able to you know kind of get multiple people in the mix, and we saw that come to fruition uh, last week when you have Olave and Michael Thomas, you know, who are going to be the focal points of a defense but then Rashid Shahid comes in here and just you know is able to dominate air yards and such like that so uh I, I like Rashid well I like Rashid Shahid in this matchup uh I think that he you know there'll be some deep shots for for him to be able to take one to the house and uh if we're getting three to one there on his anytime touchdown prop I definitely like that as well yeah, plus 310 for Shahid anytime touchdown. The receiving prop is 40 and a half right now for Shahid. Over is minus 110. The prop that set up most to me is I don't want to pick between these guys, between Shahid, Olave, and Thomas. I like all of them. So instead, why not just go Derek Carr over 232 and a half passing yards? I think that's the route that I'd want to go if, our, if I'm betting player props in the Saints. And I think across this game, I like that. Oh, it just came down. I like uh, it. So we have this live up on the on the feed right now. It goes away. OK, came back. But the same number. So 232 and a half for Derek Carr passing yardage. If I don't want to pick between three awesome receivers, Derek Carr's a dot in week one was very, very high relative to what it was in New Orleans. Now, granted, or in uh, Las Vegas, that did occur indoors. And this is not indoors. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But I don't believe Wind here is a major factor. Yeah, three mile per hour winds. That shouldn't matter too much. So if I'm betting a prop in this game, it's going to be on car over 230 at two and a half passing yards at minus 110. I feel like, Ryan, that number just a little bit, it's enticing enough to get me to bite. Yeah, he, you know, I, I think this defense, you know, we're talking about some secondary pieces missing from Carolina. But if we can get, you know, some some action uh, through through the air, uh, that, you know, you, you definitely like that. Um, it's also like Jamal Williams getting in the mix. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens this week, but I think, you know, most of us, uh, expected him to be able to kind of lead the charge with, uh, Alvin Kamara suspended. And that just didn't come to fruition, uh, in the same way that we saw when he was at Detroit. So I think that maybe they have to lean on Derek Carr's arm a little bit more, you know, through this game with the pieces missing in the secondary. Absolutely. Let's talk about the other side of the ball here, which is the Panthers side. Uh, Miles Sanders thought had a pretty good role in week one as far as the pass catching goes. His rushing plus receiving prop is 77 and a half. I haven't taken anything here personally, Ryan, but what do you see on the Panthers side when it comes to props for this game? 
Yeah, you know, I think the the young guys are re really what stands out to me. So you talk about Miles Sanders, and so many people were on Miles Sanders in in week one. Uh, and I feel like Chuba Hubbard, you know, has kind of carved out a role for himself, you know, yeah. with this Carolina Panthers team. There's a reason why he's still on the roster. Uh, I feel like even in week one, you know, Chuba was in there and, and kind of making more plays than Miles Sanders goes. And Miles Sanders has been, you know, a fantasy darling, a, an industry darling for so many years. And we thought that, you know, him being able to come here and kind of help you know, lead the charge with Bryce Young would kind of do some favors, but it just seems like maybe that is not going to come to fruition as we thought not to overreact in week one, as we talk about Jim, but I think Chubra Hubbard is the guy who I look at of, of getting more so into the mix. So I think, you know, his rushing and receiving prop and coming in at over 45 and a half is one that, you know, kind of, kind of speaks to me, leans to me. And then we're talking about the receiving court, Jim, you know, we, we always talk about, you know, the second stringers coming in when the backup quarterback is in, and, and, you know, I think the, the tight ends being able to help, you know, a rookie quarterback or young quarterback. But also we got to talk about the rookie receivers, you know, got to come in at the same time as these rookies do. And Jonathan Mingo, you know, we talked about him over the summer uh, of kind of having, you know, some splash uh, merit of, you know, futures on leading the league in, in receiving yards for rookies and things of that nature. Zay Flowers looks like he's going to be able to run away yeah. with that uh, award. But Jonathan Mingo coming in at just 26 and a half on his receiving prop. Like, I definitely love that. If I'm expecting the Saints to, you know, cover the three here and be, you know, keeping the lead, leading the charge, then I think that Bryce Young is going to have to show us that he has to throw. And, you know, it looks gross because his prop of uh, passing yards is under 200, under 190, uh, right. have you. But I think Jonathan Mingo getting 27 yards, you know, feels appropriate. So, at you know, him at minus 110 at that prop, I'm willing to to lean into that a lot. Yeah, 26 and a half, the number for Jonathan Mingo there. I did see one here that kind of did catch my attention. Uh, I agree with you that Chuba was in the mix a lot last week and probably will continue to do so because he's good enough to deserve that. But Miles Sanders receiving yardage prop is 12 and a half. And Sanders had yeah. six targets last week, which I think is tied for the third most in his entire career. It is most <laughs> since like 2020. So he was much more involved in the passing game. Now, was that because DJ Chark wasn't playing? I don't know. Uh, but... Nope, that just came down too. Maybe they're listening to us as they hear us uh, talking about props and they yeah, magically they come down. It's back up at 12 and a half, so we're good to go. But um, I think that one's least interesting based on the workload he saw last week. Any final thoughts for you on this game, Ryan? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great call out, Jim. I was just going back and looking, and yeah, he did he did see a, a number of drop offs there, even though the rushing wasn't working out for him. So, you know, I think yeah. yeah, Bryce Young is just going to have to get you know most of these guys in the mix. So, any type of prop that we can you know get that kind of ties to it, um, especially with these numbers, you know, coming in under thirty uh, for mm -hmm. receiving line, it definitely feels good. They don't have a guy above thirty, do they? <laughs> There is no, no Panthers. Like uh, I guess Thielen. Thielen. Yeah. 30 and Adam a half Thielen. on the spot. Wow. Yeah. Which is plus money. So <laughs> right. that goes to show you how, how we think about uh, his receiver line. But yeah, this Saints defense can definitely, you know, wreak havoc yeah. um, very quickly. And so yeah. if they are able to get up to that lead, um, which doesn't always feel great when we're, when we're talking about Derek Carr holding the lead. Right. But, uh, right. but I think, yeah, these, these props are definitely interesting in a route I want to go. All right, let's dive into the second game here. That is the Browns taking on the Steelers. And this one is kind of interesting, Ryan, because when I look at this one, I look at it and I, you talked about the over in the other game. I feel like this total is also too low. Personally, I don't want to like, you know, yeah. influence the way you're viewing this game, but 38 yeah. and a half for this one feels a bit light right now. The Browns are two and a half point favorites total 38 and a half. Um, the Browns money line minus 132. I actually show a quite a bit of value in the over here personally in my again, you know, young totals model. I kind of think I want to take it. So what's your read on the traditional markets here for Browns and Steelers? Yeah, I mean, that that is really what jumped off the page for me off the rip, like 38 and a half for this game, you know, feels way too low. I get it. You know, the, both of these defenses looks like they're going to play the part um, of what we think about with uh, with defenses in, in 2023. But, you know, even on prime time, you know, this matchup in the past seven games. Jim, you know, since 2020, there's only one time uh, in seven games when this game has not hit a total uh, over 
38 and a half of where it's coming in at. So it definitely feels like, you know, we're getting a good line there. Um, it's also, you know, you look in the Steelers taking two and a half, which is this deja vu uh, from, from week one when we took the two and a half against San Fran. Maybe it is. But I do like, you know, Mike Tomlin to be able to rally these guys in a bounce back spot when we're looking at him just after a loss um, and, the, and, you know, what that means historically um, for this team to be able to get up, especially at home. Uh, I do like being able to take the Steelers here at, at two and a half. And even on the money line at plus 112, I feel like there's merit to taking that here. You know, the Browns offense has not looked like <laughs> what they signed up for for when they gave right. Deshaun Watson the biggest contract in NFL history. Um, so they definitely have to prove it to me. And with Amari Cooper missing on the other side there, you know, he's going to have to find other pieces to kind of get, get things going. Now we, we'll talk about Nick Chubb in a little bit, but from an overall, you know, standpoint, I think the Steelers defense is enough to keep Deshaun contained. And if Kenny Pickett, you know, at this going against the 49ers defense, like, like we said, it, the 49ers and the Eagles control their destiny in the NFC. Like these are two of the best right. teams I am fully confident in saying that um and so it just could have been one of those matchups where you get into a gauntlet so uh just like with Justin Fields how horrible he looked against Green Bay the other week and comes into Atlanta and is able to show out a little bit I expect them to go back to the drawing board with Matt Canada who <laughs> it's tough to bet on anything with Matt Canada related to it but uh I, I do like it I do like this offense getting going yeah, I have a bit of value in the Steelers plus two and a half too. I've got it at 1.1. I have not taken it because I'm too, too scorned from last week. Also, like, you know, it's, it's thin enough value where I'm not like, eh, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay passing. But I think the, the over 38 and a half is very, very fair. Now, you mentioned the Browns offense kind of struggling. Uh, since Deshaun Watson came to town. They did show some life in the second half in week one, but now likely no Amari Cooper here. So when you look at the Browns side, any props you're liking there, Ryan? Yeah, from a prop standpoint, you know, I think it really just comes down to Nick Chubb for me. Uh, you know, his over, uh, I think it's rushing and receiving. Yeah, I'm looking at the rushing prop there at 85 and a half. Rushing and receiving, like over, it's 100 and a half now. Before we got on this gym, it was 99 and a half. And I thought, you know, even then, that's kind of a, a little bit crazy. You do like the work that he's seeing in the passing game uh, yeah. in week one. If that's any, you know, if that's any foreshadowing to what we're going to see from this year, you know, Nick Chubb is just a, a freaking smash um, all across. Across the board but um it that that still does feel a little bit lofty for me to take i'd be interested in taking the 83 and a half maybe on his rushing prop just because i think they should just so so much of it leans uh to him and with cam hayward being out on the defense you know maybe he's able to get going um other than that the only other guy that i'm looking at is elijah moore um to be able to get going here without amari cooper i think people will look at dpj Donovan, donovan people jones uh to get going there which i don't think is necessarily a mistake but when you're looking at only four and a half four or basically five yards five yards difference between these two like elijah moore was the name that we we're hearing all offseason him getting acclimated they traded for this guy when he was on the jets and uh you know really really wanted him to be a part of this offense and so 40 and a half for him you know on his receiving props especially if he's matching up with some of those uh pittsburgh Steelers corners who are able to just you know let everybody uh eat for the 49ers in week one i think elijah moore makes a ton of sense yeah i came into the year pretty skeptical of elijah moore because i you know watching his time with the jets it was frustrating and I kind of felt like whenever you get those like bad vibes, it's hard to come back from a bad vibe classification. He was firmly in the bad vibe zone, but seven targets for Elijah Moore in week one, even with Amari Cooper playing uh, only one of those was deep, but you know, he was getting a lot of work and he also had two red zone targets. So like his workload was good. They were using him in like ways that signaled to me that they want the ball in his hands. So if you take Amari Cooper out of the equation, I do feel like the Elijah Moore prop is a pretty good call out because there should, in my mind, at least based on week one, be more separation between Elijah Moore and Joku and DPJ in the receiving mark, uh, receiving yardage market. But right now they're all within five yards. So I agree with you where Elijah Moore seems like the way you'd want to go there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You mentioned Hayward too. Hayward is a big thing for, for Chubb. So Chubb, they, they are big numbers, but I think that I agree with what you were saying. We understand why they're there with Nick Chubb yep. for right now. Let's talk Absolutely. about the Steelers side of things. Offense full, fell flat in week one and now no Deontay Johnson this week. So when you look at Steelers props, what stands out to you there? Yeah, so I'm going to do the reverse. I'm going to talk about the receivers first, Jim, and then go to the running backs because of Perfect. how gross uh, that position has looked to be for the Steelers for quite some time. But George Pickett. 
this year. You know, getting seven targets last week uh, just behind Deontay Johnson with the eight before he left the game. You could tell, you know, watching that game, even against the 49ers, they wanted to get George Pickens uh, involved uh, early and often uh, in that game. So him coming in at over 42 and a half, you know, that feels appropriate. Calvin Austin even, you know, at 25 and a half, like that just feels wrong with the guy who saw six targets in week one. And not that these things are going to extrapolate one for one week over week, but without Deontay Johnson being in the mix, like there has to be somebody else that steps up, you know, outside, outside of like Friar Muth and Darnell Washington and what we think of the backfield. Um, Calvin Austin, they, they, they've made a point to, to get this guy involved. And I think, you know, he, he should definitely see some work uh, early and often. And if we can get him, you know, to four or five targets in the six target range, that's definitely appropriate to get in the over 25 and up there um and then we talk about the uh running backs real quick jim and i, I don't want to go any further than this and i'll toss it back to you like D- Najee harris in four games against the Cleveland Browns has scored in every freaking matchup against them. <laughs> so let's not even talk about his props and how gross they feel and how much we can't trust them. But when you're looking at an anytime touchdown and we're getting plus 150 and higher on Najee Harris, yep, plus 150 is where it's still at right now. Let's just take that and be what it is. Like, I do think Jalen Warren's still going to be in the mix and yeah. him, you know, over two to one to score a touchdown is kind of interesting. But they did seem like when they got into the red zone that they will st- they are still going to give Najee Harris that first kind of yeah. crack at being able to get in the goal line and we saw that happen come to fruition with the ugly backfield last week with the Eagles uh when mm-hmm. we thought that Rashad Penny was going to be the goal line back and though the DeAndre Swift the guy who they invested in is the guy who comes to fruition and I do think uh for whatever we believe in this backfield Najee Harris is the guy that the Steelers have invested in so giving him shots when he, they get close to Pater is uh where I want to get my money on this week. I also think with Najee, you're taking a shot at an upside market at plus 150 as opposed to a rushing or rushing plus receiving where like the downsides are not as baked in. So I think that makes more sense if you're looking for a uh, in a route to betting Najee. I want to see what Calvin Austin's anytime touchdown mark is. He's not a big body. Ooh, plus 650. Ooh, no, it went away again. <laughs> plus 650 or plus 750? <laughs> I didn't get to. Okay, plus 650 for Calvin Austin for anytime touchdown. I think that's pretty enticing. I think that's a number I could get behind uh, for Calvin Austin. And then with Pickens, going back to him, I think the 42 and a half is interesting because that's one he could get in like a in a hurry. I think I'd want to check out the alt markets though because Pickens is volatile and mm-hmm. you want to take advantage of the volatility. So he is plus 118 to get over 50 receiving yards. That's pretty good. Plus 182 to get over 60. I think that's where I might look for him. So... I, I think that Pickens should get a lot of work for whatever reason, because he doesn't get separation. He doesn't get a lot of work. And this this kind of allows you to take advantage of that. The fact that he is a volatile player. So I think that's pretty enticing for him. If you force me to pick between those, I kind of like the Calvin Austin anytime touchdown at plus 650. Um, mm-hmm. I, I might lean that way, but I think we're both on the same page with Pickens getting a bump, having some upside and Austin also benefiting from Deontay Johnson, not being out there. Definitely. Definitely. Especially when you see that drastic change there from minus 132 to plus 118 uh, from yeah. 40 yards to 50 yards. And this prop is coming in at 42 and a half that, uh, that definitely looks all right. I like you calling out that all market there. Yeah. I might need to go bet the Calvin Austin one. We'll see. This is, <laughs> I, we talked ourselves into Rashid Shahid on primetime a couple times last year, and that paid off. So maybe Austin's like the next Rashid Shahid for this show. So we'll Could see be. how that Definitely. goes. All righty. That is all that we have here for today. As mentioned, though, Ryan was back with us once again tomorrow. We'll be talking about uh, futures markets and stuff like that to recap week two and look forward to week number three. To get that, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Also, check us out on the FanDuel YouTube page and on FanDuel TV+. Plus. Ryan, it was a pleasure having you on as always. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. Yeah, pleasure as well, Jim. Good luck. All righty. Check out Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonis. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy both the games for tonight. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to get you set for week number three. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 